A large white hall with large windows through which the sun's rays reached all those who were in it, centered on a large table at which sat four people, three men and one girl. The people who were present in the hall cried out that they could no longer live in confusion and appealed to the saint, asking her to make a decision for the sake of eternal peace in the empire. These were the cries of the subordinates of each of the three supreme powers and the stares of the three men that ruled them. The man with the irritated look with hair as red as fire was the crown prince and swordmaster of the empire, Alexander. The second man was a high priest with golden hair and eyes that looked like he had just stepped out of a painting. His name was Ray. And the third man was a blue-eyed owner of a large trade guild. His name was Arthur. The saint couldn't understand what Arthur was thinking about. Plus, messages from the gods kept popping up in front of her eyes. Monty the god of art was composing poems about the aesthetic value of Ray's beauty. Seal the god of destruction was saying that only a proud man like Caius could achieve love. Heseth, the god of knowledge, was reading out a list of expensive items owned by Arthur's trade guild. Odysseus, the god of love, was fanatically dancing with fans. And Saint still couldn't understand how she had gotten herself into such a situation. She could hear the insistent voices of the gods, and there was no time to delay. One morning, the girl woke up in her bed, and a maid came running to her to see if she was all right. She had asked her name a couple days ago and seemed confused and worried. The girl pretended to be fine and said she was feeling better. Then Eva offered to serve her breakfast if she wasn't feeling well, she would tell her to hurry up. Also, Eva warned that if this continued, she would not be able to attend the birthday banquet of His Highness even prepared for her the dress she wanted so much. And then the girl thought that if she were Arena from the original, she would probably be horrified at the thought of not being able to see the crown prince. But she reassured En and said that she was really fine. But first she wanted to have breakfast brought to her only not a salad, but a full one. Eva was surprised that she didn't want a light salad, since she had never eaten anything like that. The second she did, Eva ran out of the room and ran to get breakfast. The girl struggled to get out of bed. But as soon as the girl was on the edge of the bed, she realized that she had sapphire eyes and looked about 17 years old. And she realized that she was the same arena. After all, in the book she had read in her past life, Saint Camilla was a virtuous woman surrounded by the attentions of three handsome men from different walks of life. In fact, these same men worshipped her. The girl knew it would end with all three becoming her husbands. But two days ago she was reborn as Arena, one of the characters in the novella. Arena's mother was a baroness from a provincial backwater, a woman who fattened her daughter. And later her daughter was treated as if she didn't even exist at all. Even in the family picture she didn't stand next to the family, but rather kept away from them. But despite the fact that Arena did not believe in the gods, she continued to regularly visit the temple. There, the girl prayed to achieve her goal and marry someone better. On one of these visits, she happened to catch the eye of the high priest Ray, who brought her to the temple. Two years have passed since then. According to her deal with the high priest, she has been diligently playing the role of saint, a role created to ensure the political stability of Alexander and High Priest Ray's terminally ill Saint Arena. Even knowing that she would be thrown out as soon as the real saint appeared, Arena believed that the High Priest would remain her guardian. And secretly she had a strange one-sided adoration for Crown Prince Alexander. It was a foolish villainess who hated Camilla, never realizing her place until the very end. And the moment she swung her dagger towards Camilla, who granted Arena forgiveness, the swords of three male interests simultaneously pierced the ungrateful maiden. Just like that, before she could even scream, she met her death. From the reader's point of view, Ariel's death was well-deserved, but she didn't want to die. She still vividly remembered her death before her rebirth. She probably couldn't come back since her body was dead. That only meant that she had to live the rest of her days in Arena's body. Since childhood, Arena had always had to be extremely careful as a bastard child. And just when she had finally collected enough money and become independent a year later, a senseless death befell her. Getting out of bed, the girl went to the window and opened it and went out onto the terrace. And she was surprised that she could breathe fresh air, after all. This is a privilege that only living people have. For when she felt the chilling touch of death from the top of her head to the tips of her toes, she realized that anything was better than death. And compared to her previous life, life as a bookish false saint is much better. 
everything had its perks. As she stretched out on the terrace and smiled, she thought that if she didn't follow the plot, she could change her future. And she thought that for sure it would be all right. She was reborn before, before Arena reached the point of no return. So there was still hope in her eyes to correct the mistakes of the book, Arena. So, standing on the terrace, she realized that she wasn't interested in either. Men who would fall in love with someone else, or Siata's position, she still had plenty of time. So instead, she focused on learning how to live in a world that was new to her. And when the real Saint Camille appears, she will simply give way to her, leave the temple, buy a house, and spend the rest of her life doing whatever she wants. For if she denied the reality of all that was happening, it would only be a waste of time. But when she accepted that she was now Arena, a sign appeared in front of her eyes that said that she, as one who had accepted her new destiny, should follow the eternal path of radiance. But she did not understand the meaning of these words. Then another tablet popped up in front of her that the ancient beings who were previously bored were interested in her excellent adaptability to hardship. She couldn't understand which ancient beings she was talking about. Even after rereading the plaque again, she still didn't understand what she was talking about. A moment later, the same tablet suddenly vanished into thin air as it had appeared. She was beginning to think she was dreaming. But suddenly someone knocked on the door and came in. It was Ray. But the girl thought to herself, where is Eva? And then Ray said that he had brought her breakfast. And she realized that it was Ray and he was the supreme guardian of the Pantheon High Priest. Ray was surprised that she was just calling him by his first name today. And then the girl realized that only the true Saint Camille called everyone by their first names. But Arena called him High Priest. She smiled and apologized as she was a bit distracted today. But Ray told her that he liked the way she called him. Ray had forgotten that he had a name too. Then Ray looked at her with his golden eyes and asked her to call him by his first name only from now on. Then Arena thought that if it was Arena from the original, her eyes would sparkle with joy, but it would be better if she didn't cross the line. Arena corrected herself and said that she had now misspoken, for how dare she call the high priest by name. She, turning to the high priest, said that she was truly sorry. Ray tilted his head and grinned, and calmly said that he had said it before, but would say again that the palace was Arena's home. Arena thought that in the novella, Ray was described as a bright and calm person. But then Ray said that he could give her anything she wanted, whatever it was, he would do it. But he wanted her to know that freedom comes with responsibility. Camille was truly a saint. In the original story, when she became a saint, the only one who called her by name was the high priest of the temple, a man whose influence was as powerful as even the imperial family. Ray brought an ordinary girl named Arena into the temple and convinced everyone that she was a true saint. That's the kind of man he was. Arena really wanted to hear her name out of his mouth, but what a pity. Even though he kept smiling, she felt pressured. She bowed with the thought that he was the only one who knew she was a fake and thanked him aloud for bringing her breakfast. But before Ray was about to leave, he said that even though they had met just recently, she looked different than usual and called her by her name. A few hours later, Arena was sitting at her textbooks in the library. She stretched, exhaling, and she told herself that she had enough with studying for today. So, she figured she had done well last time too, having a good conversation with Ray. She decided to just sit and think about what she had over the past few days. She made sure to note that it was now 722 on the sacred calendar and 82 on the imperial calendar. Also, five years before the true Saint Camilla had appeared, and she was in a country where religion coexists with Alexander's monarchical family. Also, 99% of people believe in a god, but not one one. There are many gods with different names with temples set up for each of them. There are gods such as God of Justice, God of Knowledge, God of Love, God of Art, God of Destruction, God of Kindness, God of Death, God of Lies, God of Eternity. There were nine gods in all. And Arena was just in the shrine where all the nine gods are worshipped. So among all the temples, this one was considered the most special. Here the saints who were closest to the gods were born. And this temple was the overall religious leader of the empire. Arena opened the book, hoping that there must be some information related to the prophecies. She found in the book that only the Holy One could receive prophecies. One of the nine gods will give the saint the prophecies that carry the wisdom. 
and the books detail the process of receiving prophecy. Like a curtain, a blue glow appears on which the spell engraved right before your eyes. Then it fades and disappears. But the enchanting prophecies remain as clear in the heart. And then Arena thought that probably because people do not understand the language of the gods, it took this form. And then Arena remembered that in the novel, there was an episode where Camille used the so-called divine power, but there was not a single word related to the prophecies. Arena knew, however, it had nothing to do with her. She needed a book that would help her in the future. Then Arena realized that there were as many books here as in the Imperial Library, and she needed to read as many as she could. And since almost no one comes in here, she can stay here as long as she likes. Arena also knew that there was a monthly payment for her duty as a saint, which was the same as her previous life. If you add it all up and calculate it according to Korean money, she will get 220 million won for a year, since everything is provided by the temple, so if she works hard and saves money, then even after she leaves, she will be able to afford a carefree and comfortable life. For example, the artifacts donated by the nobles. If she sells them, she will also get a large sum of money. Here the girl realized that Arena used to drain all the money as soon as she got her salary. But she is different. After all, having saved up enough money, she will leave the temple and buy a good building. And then suddenly, a sign appeared in front of Arena again, where it was written that bored ancient beings were looking at her records with curiosity. Sitting at the table, Arena was already looking at the sign and was no longer so surprised by its appearance. Although somewhere in the back of her mind, she realized that even though she had entered the world of the novel, she couldn't understand why a tablet was appearing in front of her. She reached out her hand towards this tablet, but it passed through her, and she realized that she still couldn't touch it, and she thought it was some kind of mistake. At that moment, someone knocked on the door. Ava entered the library and brought her a snack. Arena was just thinking that it was about time they brought her food. Arena decided to ask Ava if she could see it, and pointed her hand to the sign that was behind her back. But she couldn't see the sign, so she didn't understand where Arena was pointing. So Ava only wished Arena a speedy recovery, and Arena realized that she was the only one who could see the signs. Ava said out loud that Arena was still weak and would have a hard time coping with her duties as a saint. Arena thought to herself, as she looked at the food on the tray that all she had done for the past three days was sleep and read books. Arena thought that Camilla was a real saint, and that was why she visited many temples and met many priests. And her duties also included regular audiences with the emperor and the crown prince. But since she isn't a real saint, she doesn't have an official job as a saint. Ava pulled Arena out of her musings and told her that her younger brother had been injured and it turned out that he was also in debt and perhaps he needed her help. Eva also added that she would like her monthly allowance and she hoped it would give her a little more than usual. Arena looked closely at Ava's smile and realized why it was so familiar to her because she had seen it before as the illegitimate child of a wealthy family. This was the smile of people who were intent on taking advantage of her. It was a nasty look, very reminiscent of the people she had encountered in her past life. The girl thought that although Arena was an evil but naive woman, and this would not have happened if the previous owner of this body had a brain, in other words, for Ava, who would never get rid of the status of an ordinary maid, Arena was just a profitable, stupid mistress, but she wasn't the same Arena from before. So Arena decided to ask Eva if she had ever given her money and in what quantity. Eva replied that of course she had, and that she had done her a great favor by worrying about her younger brother, and also replied that the mistress paid her 650 francs a month, but she was not asking for much just to increase her salary by another 50 francs. But Arena, sitting on the chair, thought that the most the headmaid could get was only 200 francs, but she was getting 650 francs. Now she knew the reason why the former Arena had no money. Arena also said out loud that how could she let the maid abuse her, that it was a total disappointment. Eva realized that Saint was not in the mood today, so she asked her to think it over before giving her an answer. But Arena said that it didn't need to be delayed, and from now on she won't give her a dime. Arena also continued with a disgruntled look that since she was the saint's maid, she was paid more than enough without it. So why should she ask her for money? Ava was about to object, but Arena interrupted her and said that if she was so concerned about her brother, she should bring him to her. Arena said that she had heard that there was a shortage of labor in the stables, 
and she would look at her brother and tell her if he was fit for the job. Arena thought to herself as she looked at Ava that the one who thought herself superior to her had come down from heaven to earth, and no doubt she was both shocked and angry because she was familiar with that look as she had come through so much, and it was no surprise to her. But then Eva told Arena what she had forgotten, because Eva knew her secret that she was a false saint. And then Arena realized that she had made a mistake. She had not given her the money because she felt sorry for her. Arena was not a generous person, but she was scared to death of being exposed because she was so stupid that she groveled before the servant that blackmailed her. Eva kept saying that if she revealed the truth that the saint was a fake, then she thought she could finish it and the saint would pay her the money after all. But Arena beat her to it saying she could go ahead and tell. But Eva didn't realize if she had misheard or not. After all, up until now, Arena had planned to keep giving money to Eva for her silence. At first it was 300 and 400 francs and now she is asking for 700. But things have changed. As Arena sat across from Eva, she said that she could go and tell everyone that she is a fake. Eva said that if she told, then she had overdrunk her. Arena said that if it was found that she was a fake, she would probably be executed. That's what would happen to the maid who got 650 francs a month for hiding a fake saint. And then Eva thought that Arena had tricked her in her own game because she had never thought about it and did not even imagine what they do to her and how she will be dealt with because it is Arena half noblewoman, and so if she dies, she will die beautifully and with honors. And what people will do with the servants? Arena got up from her seat and approached Eva and said that in the end, she would envy her, who would be taken to the guillotine. If she knew she was a fake, then she should have told about it. She knew they were in the same boat or she could risk her life. The saint also said that Eva's family probably knew she was a fake too, but Eva was quick to say that her family didn't know anything. But Arena wasn't sure about that, and the best solution would be to talk to them personally. After what the saint said, Eva fell on her knees with her head bowed and said that she had been too willful and she wouldn't ask her for money anymore. With frightened eyes she gave her word that she would not make such a mistake in the future. The saint could not believe that Arena was being spun by this immature child. But Eva kept begging the saint for forgiveness. But at that moment, Ray walked into the libraries. Eve turned and saw the high priest, and then Ray drew his sword from his sheath and killed the maid. Arena couldn't believe he had done that. After what he had done, Ray put the sword back in his sheath. Arena stood there with a dumbfounded look, because due to the circumstances, the decision was made immediately. Arena tried to take it for granted, saying to herself that Ray's judgment was right, as Eva was a bad child, because she used a secret she shouldn't know to blackmail her and there was no guarantee that she wouldn't tell anyone about it B. Leaving Ray said he would order the mess cleaned up and Arena could rest. Arena realized that the only problem was that this decision was the right one. Just like Eve, who died before she could say a word. One day, she would die like that too. A couple seconds later, the sign appeared again, that the ancient beings who were bored were interested in her intelligence. Then another, the ancient beings who were bored were interested in her ability to judge, then another. The ancient beings who were bored were interested in her calmness, and the last one, that she was nearing the condition for the prophecy to be revealed. As Ray walked down the corridor, he thought about the situation that had happened a few minutes ago. He couldn't figure out if this girl had always been so ambitious, but it couldn't be. Otherwise, with a head on her shoulders, she wouldn't have let herself be dragged into this. Elam is the temple where the Devadi gods are worshipped. In addition to the Holy One who worships all the gods, the priests in the temples serve the various gods. Thus, the High Priest Ray serves Manthi, the god of arts. Also, after a few hours, the saint was assigned a new maid. She bowed to her and begged her forgiveness, as she would try not to make such mistakes. Arena said that everything was fine and she was free to go. The maid apologized again and told her to call her if she needed anything. Holding her head, Arena thought that the maid had made such a fuss just because of the salad. Basically, they were willing to tiptoe around such little things, and it made the saint very tired. Arena changed maids, and she sometimes began to get confused in them, so she asked if she was not mistaken that her name was Isabel. Arena also remembered the situation in the library, and began to think that this was not modern times, and therefore the value of human life was different. Only a day had passed, 
and the other maids were so calm about Eva's death. But she wasn't used to that. Now Arena understood why Ray did so, as she is already a saint. And this is a secret that can turn the Empire upside down. A strong blow to both the Temple and the Emperor. But due to the circumstances, the decision was made immediately. Arena went to the camp and sat behind it, and thought it would be best for her to escape as soon as possible while she was over waiting for the real saint's life expectancy may be shortened, so Eve is dead, and there is no guarantee she won't be next. But what is this dialogue box twitching creature? The existence of some prophecy was like an eyesore to her. She sat there calculating prices in the local stores in the capital. She thought it would be quite difficult to manage if she sold all the artifacts. She could buy a medium-sized building. Also in the original story, Arena was indifferent to Ray, so no one would stop her from leaving. As long as she plays by his rules, Ray won't pay attention to her. While she sat at her desk and wrote, she made a plan for the next three years. There was no more Ava, so she wouldn't have to give 65% of her salary to someone else. Now all she had to do was save and save. But then it seemed to Arena that there was someone else in the room besides her, and she turned around. Arena saw that Ray had entered the room. She bowed her head to Ray and wondered if it was normal for a saint to enter the room so suddenly. She greeted him. Ray bowed to her too and thought about her learning the official saint's greeting and thanked her. And then Ray looked at the table and saw some notes and asked her again if she was studying now. Arena turned around and realized why he asked such a question and hurriedly explained herself. She said that she wanted to show him something and he was surprised and watched her carefully. As Arena realized that on the piece of paper was just the calculations of her savings, if he considers it, then he will guess about her escape plan, and then he will be very angry. Arena said that tomorrow was just His Highness Crown Prince Alexander's birthday celebration. So she prepared a birthday speech and asked him how he liked it, or should it be rewritten as the real Arena wrote it, and she would never have thought she could use her writing. Ray took the piece of paper in his hand, where the congratulatory speech was written, and started to read carefully. But suddenly, Ray began to read aloud and clenched the paper in her hand, as she wished His Highness a happy birthday, and emphasized twice that he was her dear Crown Prince Alexander. And Ray continued to read that His Majesty was born to be loved, and she was drowning in that love only because of His Highness's existence, and the love of all the gods belonged only to him. At this point, Arena was drenched in color. She pulled the sheet from Ray and realized that she knew that Arena was being silly, but who would have thought that to this extent? And how would she now apologize for this prank? She said she better rewrite it anyway. Ray asked her with a serious look if she was in love with Crown Prince Alexander. Arena quickly explained that that's not the kind of love meant here. And also as gods love ordinary people, she blessed Prince Alexander meaning love by blessing. Ray asked what if Crown Prince Alexander didn't understand her message? What would she do about it then? Arena thought that this congratulatory speech of Arena was written from the bottom of her heart. And yet the chance that Crown Prince Alexander would take it seriously was extremely slim. If she were the real Arena right now, she would be furious, but she would leave it at that. But Arena had said that congratulatory speeches were meant to be read to an audience, and if the audience misunderstood everything, she was obligated to make corrections. Ray handed her a piece of paper and smiled, because he thought he had imagined it, but she had matured a lot lately, so he gave her the piece of paper. She was surprised that he praised her for her maturity just because of that speech. But as he handed the piece of paper, it fell out of his hands and onto the floor. Ray ordered her to stand still as she was about to pick it up, but he had already bent down on one knee and picked it up himself. Standing on one knee, he held out the sheet to her and began to rise. She thanked him for it and realized she didn't dare look him straight in the eye. When Ray gave her the leaf, he said goodbye and said they would see each other tomorrow morning. Now, Saint and her maids walked through the library and tried to make herself forget about the embarrassing memories as she had to prepare for tomorrow's event. But then some shouting came from the reference department. Arena looked into that department and saw a man harassing some girl in a closet, and she asked him to stop it immediately as he could not do that to a priestess apprentice who worships God. But the man replied that just because she worships God doesn't mean she doesn't have time to have dinner with him. And besides, she hasn't been officially accepted as a priestess yet and is only on probation. 
The girl answered that whether it was formal or not, she was serving God in the same way. The man told her that if not, how about having a drink with him so that she would stop resisting? It would be more interesting than some library. Arena realized that the man was a devout Christian. The girl said with fear in her eyes that if he continued to insult her, she would go to the temple and report him and asked him to get out of here. Arena couldn't stand it and said that if he wanted a woman so badly, then let him go outside the temple and look for her there as this girl was here for training. The girl recognized her and understood that it was a saint. Arena looked at the man once again and told him to get out of here. The man only replied to her that they were having a nice conversation here and they weren't talking about anything like that. But Arena told him that it wasn't like she was content to hang out with him. The girl turned to Saint and said that he was brazenly molesting her without her consent, to which the man was surprised and recoiled from the girl. The man turned to the girl and said that she had been chosen in vain to be a future priestess as brazen lies would not adorn her. The man turned away from the girl and waved her off saying that he could not have insulted her. She was dumbfounded and said that he had just invited her to have a drink with him. The saint couldn't stand it and asked him what family he was from and he said his name was Hans and he was from the family of Baron Redfield. Arena thought she didn't recall his family in politically known circles and didn't remember any Hans while she thought Hans said he had introduced himself and now it was her turn to say who she was. Hans also said with a smirk that it was the girl who had insulted him today and he had put his whole heart and soul into the temple in the name of his family and the temple saint but was humiliated. The servants of the holy immediately stood up for her and said how can he say such a thing? Doesn't he realize who he is talking to? Arena wanted to question the girl. But Hans interrupted her and said that she was deliberately avoiding answering his questions. Arena asked the girl who had the authority to expel from this temple. The girl replied that three individuals have that authority. She also answered that the chief in the temple, the high priest, and the Holy One herself have the authority to expel him. Arena also said that this is the way it is and to be banished from the temple is tantamount to banishment from secular society. Hans didn't think he was all that and said she could even go and complain to the saint. But Arena stepped closer to him and said that there was no need for that because she was the saint. Hans shuddered at the realization that the saint was indeed standing in front of him. She told him that she would file a formal complaint against his family about his deeds. Hans, in a panic, quickly began to apologize to the saint. Hans got down on his knees and directly begged for forgiveness and in his defense said that he never thought she was the saint. He also added that if he had known that she was a saint, he would not have dared to behave like that with her and he realized that he had made a terrible mistake. But the saint had said that forgiveness had to be earned. Hans immediately asked how he could earn this forgiveness, to which the saint said that he should first apologize to the girl. But he did not want to apologize to the girl so much that he began to say that he was only joking, that he did not mean it, to which the saint replied that he probably wanted to say that her eyes and the eyes of the nine gods were wrong. But he bowed his head to this girl and began to apologize saying that he was wrong. At this time, the girl cried from the fact that she apologized. The saint, watching this situation, smiled and thought that the conflict was over. Arena turned to one of her maids and asked her to get her a book of blessings for persons and royalty from the shelf behind the man. When the maid went to retrieve that book, a tablet appeared in front of Arena that said that the ancient beings who were bored were deeply interested in her justice. Other signs kept appearing that said that the ancient beings who were bored were deeply interested in her will that she had unlocked the ability to receive prophecies, that the ancient beings were deeply interested in her existence. Soon, the last plaque popped up, and the last plaque that said she was the first person to be granted this ability by the gods. Soon, she was sitting at a table in her chambers, and she was looking for something in the books, and eventually found what she was looking for, and wondered if the gods were interested in her, and she thought that maybe her existence was strange to them, because she was sick of these notifications, but they kept popping up as if some cool nightclub had opened today. At the same time, these notifications were more like the interface of some game, and there were several notifications that the God of Knowledge was wondering what the nightclub was. The God of Love was inquisitively flapping his eyes. The God of Art was drawing her portrait. 
She realized that she was not a saint, so what was it doing here? Since prophecy is an innate ability of the saint that is activated in special cases only, so and no other way and not a word about exceptions in the book was not said. So did the rest of the notifications pop up after she thought she wished she could turn off all those prophecies, and the gods weren't happy either. The god of arts threatened her portrait, the god of love resented it, and the god of knowledge looked at her with puppy eyes. And a sign popped up asking if she was sure she wanted to turn off the prophecy functions. But after the gods rebelled, she decided not to disable them. Arena still didn't understand why the prophecies were being displayed to her if she wasn't a true saint. After a second, a new sign popped up that said the god of knowledge wanted to show her something, and the next thing to activate was the censor. And she began to absorb the contents of the book, and it seemed as if she was reading dozens or even hundreds of books at once. Since there were even books that were not in the library, including etiquette at imperial banquets and a collection of congratulatory speeches for banquets. She was delighted as she would no longer have to worry about having so much knowledge. But then she was interrupted and a sign came up saying that she had a low level of prophecy and that using the censor was impossible. She had too low a level to absorb so much knowledge. But a sign came up again that said she had received a blessing from the God of knowledge. She also felt that her head became a thousand times lighter and with just a glance, she memorized the contents of the books. She was still under the impression so suddenly, it seems fortune had turned the right side to her. After she had taken a bath, she stretched as the bath had refreshed her, and she remembered that she had read a lot of books in one go yesterday, but she had not forgotten to rest. And in addition, the effect of Hayseed's blessing lasted only three hours. It was great to be able to memorize everything so quickly, but everything returned to its usual pace when the effect was over. At that moment, there was a knock on the door and Ray entered the room. As soon as he walked in, he smilingly greeted her and asked if she had slept well. She still had a sign that the God of Arts couldn't take his eyes off Ray, and she told him that she slept just fine and all thanks to God's blessing. Ray saw that she had done a good job last night. Arena told him that she had been carefully preparing for the prince's birthday so as not to embarrass the temple. She also thought to herself that in the end, if she wanted to survive, she had to show her sincerity to a true saint and she only needed to maintain good relations with everyone. She also apologized to him since she had been acting infantile until now. And she added that she didn't know how soon the real saint would appear. But until then, she would try to fulfill her duties with honor and dignity so as not to cause trouble for him. But Ray gave her a stern look and said that since he had told her before, he would tell her a second time that this place was her home and she should stop talking nonsense. Arena stood smiling, but inside she was tense as his words suggested that since she knew his secret, he would not let her live like Eva. Ray held out his hand to her and said that now he wanted to see the speech she had prepared. Arena gave him a sheet of paper and he began to study the speech. Ray was looking at the speech very carefully and thinking. Arena got worried and asked if everything was okay with the speech. Ray replied that it was fine, but it was just that her speech was very well put together and she had really matured lately, and her writing skills had improved a lot. Arena smiled as she had just taken a prepared speech from a book to avoid suspicion. She also said that she had actually taken one of the passages in the book, which she had tweaked slightly to fit the subject matter. It made sense to Ray then, and it explained a lot of things. Ray also remembered that he had heard that there had been some sort of incident in the library recently. Arena replied that there was indeed such an incident she went to the library to find a book she needed. And there she caught a scion of the Redfield family molesting one of the students. She also said that as a saint, she had reprimanded him for maybe going a little overboard. Ray replied that he had contributed to their excommunication. He had also banished Hans himself, as well as everyone who belonged to the Redfield family. Ray had said that if any such nonsense happened in the future, he should be informed and he would deal with it appropriately. But Arena still couldn't understand why he had excommunicated them from the church, since Hans had apologized to the girl. And after a couple of seconds, new signs came up that the God of Knowledge had analyzed Ray thoroughly, and the God of Knowledge advised to be careful with him also. He thought that he was rotten through and through. And another sign came up that the God of Arts claimed that appearance was more important than inner qualities. 
but Arena didn't understand what the gods were doing here. While Arena was looking at the signs that popped up one after another, Ray noticed that she was looking through something and asked if she was okay. She replied that she was fine, and she admired his determination, for it was not easy to get rid of the rot that lurked in people's wicked hearts. She also added that profit and interest were intertwined, involving a third party. Ray replied that the priests think of him as a dictator, but the saint seems to have a different opinion. To which Arena replied with a smile that she thought he was an honest and fair man, always acting accordingly. And she could say that sincerely, because when she read the book, he appeared to her just like that. Also, Arena thought that unlike the prince, who pursued political gain, Ray, decided to venture with a fake saint to calm the agitated people. For the villainous Arena, he was a cruel executioner. But for Saint Camilla, on the contrary, Ray became a protection and support. If not for her fate as an antagonist, she would surely admire him. He turned to leave and said he was sorry for taking up her time and wished her a pleasant meal. Arena breathed out a sigh of relief and thought that again she had said something wrong and everything seemed to be going well but from his reaction, nothing was clear. And she remembered that the signs from the gods had been displayed all this time, and from the awkwardness of the whole situation, she asked them to stop talking nonsense. As Ray walked down the hallway, he couldn't figure out what had changed in her. He noticed that her eyes were blue, and he hadn't noticed that before. And he couldn't figure out if Arena was a woman who could smile like that, because the reason he had brought her was because she was naive and stupid enough to play her role without question. And he realized that it didn't matter how much she had changed after all. But then the head priest of the temple interrupted his thoughts and asked Ray to explain, because he had heard about what had happened in the library and didn't understand how the whole family could be excommunicated without consulting him. He understood that it was the Holy One's decision, but how could it be so easily approved? because you couldn't excommunicate an entire family because of the misconduct of one of its members. The head priest was outraged by this, as he and the other priests thought it was unacceptable. Ray suggested that it was more likely that the head priest must have gotten it wrong, since in fact, the deciding reason for the family's banishment was that they were making dirty deals with the fallen priests of their temple. Since one person had told Ray that it was hard to get rid of the rot, and he couldn't disagree, he rather enjoyed the process. And so he was going to tear out everything that was rotten to the core. To which the priest replied that he was only here to express the hope that he would like to discuss what had happened with him. Since it was absurd that a saint who had never properly performed her job as a saint would thus try to abuse her title since the high priest has the right to exercise, but she is a sacrilege. Ray said that recently he had heard that the minds of Ares were emitting dark energy because of this anomaly and dozens of monsters had been seen there. And when people are idle, they tend to do all sorts of stupid things, so he instructed the head priest to go to the Ares mine and investigate it. But the head priest was in a panic and said that he would go there, but he didn't know if he would return to the temple. And as head priest, he could not leave the temple, he became too old and weak. At the same time, that girl from the library came to the saint and her maid explained that the girl insisted that she had to meet her by all means. Arena wanted to know what she wanted to tell her after all, and the girl knelt down and told the saint that she wanted to serve her. Arena happily replied that she had enough maids because originally the saint had been followed by priestesses with magic in addition to the maids who looked after her. But Ray had not assigned her a single priestess because she was a false saint, and it was dangerous to keep this girl near her. The girl explained that she couldn't even thank her properly that time, and she owed her a huge debt. And with tears in her eyes, she repeated that she wanted to serve the saint. But Arena didn't know what to do about it. But for starters, she asked her maid to go out the door and leave her alone with this girl. Arena said that not long ago, a maid named Ava had died before her eyes, and she had been by her side for quite a long time. She asked the girl if she knew the cause of death. Arena explained to her that she had suffered such a fate only because she could not keep her mouth shut, because the experienced maid who had served her for so long had died, and she thought she could last longer than she did, and she thought that after such words, she would get cold feet. The girl said sure as ever that she still wanted to be near her. The girl explained that she was an orphan she was raised by her uncle, and now she lives and studies in the temple, but not much has changed since then. 
and also all her life she could not say a word to the pompous nobles, all she could cry and beg to stop from powerlessness. But that day for the first time in her life, a nobleman apologized to her. Since the saint was like a light that illuminated her gray life, and she would love to be like her anyway, she wanted to dedicate her whole life to serving the gods, so why not dedicate it to the saint? The saint at this time was stunned and didn't even know how to react to such words. The girl also said that she was certainly afraid of the thought that she might die without repaying her kindness, and she would certainly try her best. She reminded Arena of her own past. Like this girl Anna, she was trying her best to survive. Arena answered her that if she could be useful to her, she would live, but she could not guarantee the safety of her family and whether she had changed her mind after saying that. The girl replied with joy on her face that of course she hadn't changed her mind and thanked her for the opportunity. In the next second, Saint was already greeted by the Holy Knight. His name was Dan. Saint replied that it was a pleasure to meet him. The Saint sat in the carriage and reflected on the fact that she finally had a job. And today, as a member of the clergy, she was going to the Crown Prince's 20th birthday banquet. She also looked at the temple and realized that it was much larger than she had thought, and even the journey to the gate was taking a decent amount of time in the future. If she wanted to leave the temple, she would need a horse. And since there were stables near the main building, she would have to try to ride one sometime. As the carriage rode down the main street, people showed the saint their honor and respect, and she realized what it meant to be a saint. A saint is honored and warmly welcomed by the people, she is the one who speaks with the mouth of the gods. And she wondered if it was true that the message that was popping up them and was really being sent by the gods. At that moment, the god of knowledge sent the message that he is not content. And she assumed that since she wasn't a real saint, the gods were too, if they had proof that they were real. And then there was thunder and lightning lighting up the heavens. And she saw the sign and decided to believe that the gods were real after all. She couldn't understand why there was such silence, and suddenly the god of love asked her why she was smiling. She thought she was glad they couldn't read her thoughts. She finally arrived at the imperial palace. As soon as she entered the palace, everyone was already glaring at her. She remembered that she had gone through this many times in the past. She repeated to herself that she needed to raise her chin higher and walk with a confident gait. As she walked along the blue path, the orchestra played wonderful, even magical music. And finally, she stopped in front of two thrones, where the emperor and his empress sat. It was Emperor Arsene Eliade and Empress Rose Eliade. Also, Arena knew that she was the daughter of Count Michael, and the former countess had become the empress three years ago, and the one who was standing with a sword next to the emperor was Crown Prince Alexander Eliade. The saint bowed in curtsy and congratulated His Highness on his 20th birthday and blessed his royal family. The king accepted the congratulations and thanked the saint and asked her to raise her head. The saint raised her head and did not realize that she would be treated so well. But she also saw that Alexander did not even hide his contempt and hatred. But in the beginning, God created the world, dividing the great power into nine parts. God's mercy made the empire prosperous. The valiant emperor was chosen by the God of justice, the crown prince that was born under the blessed star of the God of destruction. Being a wise man helped the theocratic system to become supreme. This is a gift from all nine gods, a sacred blessing to the empire. The saint said that the temple obeys and bows its head to the imperial family and congratulates his imperial highness, the crown prince. She approached Alexander and gave a speech that he was blessed by the god of destruction and all the other eight gods. She opened her eyes because she felt like she was being stared at but only the prince was looking at her like that and apologized because she was as embarrassed as he was. Still, he held out his hand to her and she kissed the back of his palm. The crown prince took his hand back and she thought it was good that it went off without a hitch and couldn't understand why Arena was so eager to do all this. At that moment, the prince wanted to say something, but suddenly there was a huge explosion behind Saint's back. None of the guests did not understand what happened and where the explosion came from. Saint fell to the floor, and when everything had already developed from the dust, she saw that in front of her stood the prince, who was going to take out his sword. The emperor and the empress were also shocked by what was happening, and they all wanted to understand what happened, and then someone shouted that the lightning struck the statue of the first emperor. But Arena couldn't understand where the lightning came from. 
That bronze statue of the emperor was completely destroyed. Everyone asked each other if there were any casualties or if everyone was unharmed. But Arena looked at the glass ceiling through which the lightning had struck and saw that there was not a single cloud in the sky and whether it was Chest who had done something. And then, the plaques from the gods began to appear again. God of Art became uncomfortable as she kissed the prince's hand and the god of knowledge said that he only thought about the lightning but didn't want to do it in reality and he felt injustice. Then she looked at the crown prince and realized that the statue of the first emperor had been destroyed and if the crown prince ascended the throne, it would be devastating to the empire. At this moment, the empress groaned and said that even at such an hour when the Holy One bestowed her blessing on them, the gods were angry with them. Arena looked away from her and thought that the empress was not getting along with the prince. But it was no wonder she was the emperor's new wife, and the situation was as bad as it could get, and something had to be done. Also everything happened after her speech, and she thought that Alexander might be angry with her because of what happened, and she had to do something urgently. But the emperor suddenly turned to the saint and asked that upon returning to the temple, everyone pray for the empire. Although the saint told his highness the crown prince that he would tell the gods how he had felt their grace. But neither the prince nor the emperor understood what the saint meant. She explained that his highness was born under the patronage of Seal the God of Destruction and so he had received his blessing. She continued that destruction is a form of creation and it is the source of greatness and the mother of all things. The emperor and all those present in the hall believed this, and they believed that they could see the divine power. Arena also said that no one was hurt, and the god of destruction wanted to welcome his highness on the day of his birth, so he could not contain his joy. After this speech, she was able to go out for a breath of fresh air and thought that it was literally a thunderclap, and she should tell the gods to stop being childish. And she should have also looked into the relationship between the empress and the crown prince. She had resolved this predicament pretty well, so she should have gotten back soon. But then someone approached her. She turned around and behind her was the crown prince. And he said that the festivities had just begun. And he hoped she wasn't about to leave. And she still couldn't figure out what was wrong with this guy. Arena asked the prince if he had something to do with her. He told her that she was acting differently today than usual. She asked him what that meant whether it was about transmitting the will of the gods or interpreting lightning as a blessing. Alexander said that today, she had solved such a problem alone and her behavior had changed so much that he wondered if she had been replaced. She explained that she had been living her life casually, but she was bored with it, so she decided to do her part. He looked at her with a hard stare and said that he would believe her, but in that case, she had to explain herself. Arena didn't understand why she had to explain herself and then the crown prince took out a letter and said that he had recently received a letter of proposal from her. Arena didn't understand how this could happen and wondered how Arena could do such a thing. So Alexander said that he was aware of many things, but still he didn't expect her to go this far. He also asked that when she wrote the letter, she was aware of who she was. She decided to calm down and think about it, even though it was a marriage proposal letter, but it was written in a childish way. Her first variant was, a beautiful refusal, something like that he would be disappointed, but he would not care about her love troubles. The second option was a rude refusal, something like that the saint must have wanted to die if she wrote to him like that. But she thought that in any case it was necessary to justify herself, and she said that the letter was a mistake. He asked her if she had misheard him, and she said it was a mistake. She looked away from him and said that it was the alcohol, and she seemed to have had too much to drink that day. Because she was under the influence of alcohol, she had written that nonsense. She had even sent it to his highness and she was really sorry. So anyway, she had helped him today and hoped that he would forget the mistake. But the prince asked if there could be such sincere mistakes as he was shocked by this. He quickly went to her and took her by the chin and told her that she had written about it like every night that she missed him and wished to see him. And to top it off, she wrote that she would be happy if he accepted her proposal. He moved even closer to her face with a snide smile and said that she had written everything in such detail and how could she have forgotten about it? She cursed Arena with all the light in the world because she didn't understand how she was supposed to sort all this out. She knew she should have done the legwork as soon as that ill-fated statue broke. The prince asked how she would explain it since she had written eight pages. 
She explained that she had drunk a whole tank of wine then, and so she couldn't remember anything and asked him to forgive her. And in parallel, she couldn't think what Arena was thinking when she wrote that letter. But the prince smilingly said that people usually when they drink, become more honest with themselves, and they tell about their secret desires. The saint said that he should pretend it never happened, since Seal's blessing would be her apology. And she asks him to forgive her for troubling him. And now, to avoid such things, she will be more careful. Then the prince said that she must be laughing at him now. He was furious. He could not stand it and grabbed Saint's hand and said that she did not know how many sleepless nights he had spent in thought after receiving her letter. He was furious and didn't understand why she wrote it off to alcohol, because she didn't even remember anything. And then suddenly, lightning struck again right in the fountain, which was next to them. But Arena didn't waste time and grabbed the papers from the prince's hands and ran away. The prince tried to stop her, but couldn't. While she was running to the carriage, she was already calling Dan from afar and saying that they were leaving. As she climbed into the carriage and closed herself in, she exhaled and tried to catch her breath and realized she was afraid to imagine what would have happened if it hadn't been for the lightning and asked the gods if it had been their doing. And a sign popped up that the god of knowledge had coughed nervously. And she realized that of course it was their mischief. But this time, she was very grateful. But she looked at the papers and remembered how the prince had shouted at her while blushing, saying that he had spent many nights without sleep thinking after receiving the letter. And she too had blushed. She thought that she would go crazy. Because of this, she was very ashamed. And she realized that the situation with Arena's letter was much more complicated than she thought because it was getting dangerous. And however, she should work harder. But first, she had to escape and tearing the letter she threw it out of the window. The man held out his hand and pointed to the pottery and said that this was Count Balmer's next lot. The man also added that it was once used to store holy water in the ancient temple of Urus, and its starting price is 100 francs. The girl at number 97 said she was giving 100 francs. Other men at number 33 gave 150. At number 56 gave 200 francs. And the last word was the man at number 56 gave 200 francs and the lot was sold to him. All this was watched by Saint and Dan, and Arena wondered what she had forgotten here, and the sign came up as it was the will of the god of art. Dan had the same question about what they were doing here. The saint just smiled and said that everything was God's will, as it was indeed the will of the gods, and since it happens from time to time that things bought cheaply at auction turn out to be treasures thanks to such coincidences, some people got rich and became millionaires. Well, Arena didn't want to let her luck slip away. After all, she could hope for the help of the God of Arts. If the lot was worthwhile, the God of Arts would let her know about it. But Dan sitting next to her didn't understand what was going on with the saint, and it scared him. The man announced the next item, and it was a piece of Countess Almir's. And as soon as the man brought out the dagger, the God of Arts began to examine it. The man also went on to say that dragon bone and bronze were used to create it. It is said that this unremarkable blade holds divine power. The girls in the front row began to whisper. They were surprised that dragon bone was used for the blade, but Arena didn't think it was really made of dragon bone except for one hundredth of it. She realized it wasn't a value that apparently the people here were using the same tricks as the advertisers in her previous life. Also, the sign that the God of Arts was staring at the dagger came up again, but the man said that the starting bid was 50 francs, and the girl at number 13 had already bet her 50 francs, and Arena decided to ask the God of Arts what's up with this dagger, and that he should hurry up otherwise she, before she could say anything, a new sign appeared saying that the God of Arts wants this dagger, and then Arena number 71 said that she would give 100 francs for the dagger. The man immediately banged his hammer and said that this item was sold for 100 francs. For Arena, it was very exciting, and Dan still did not understand what was going on, and then Arena said that she had to look somewhere and called him with her. They went outside and walked towards some building, and it was Arthur's trade guild. Arena clearly remembered that he was the most powerful guild owner in the Empire, and one of the three main male interests of Cass Arthur. He was the heir to one of the largest guilds. Walking into the shop, she thought that he was the only male character who was not related to Arena in any way, and she wouldn't want to cross paths with him from now on. But she had only come here because Arthur's trade guild was known for its talented appraisers. 
The man asked how he could help her. Arena told the man that she wanted to sell something and held out the bundle thinking that she should make the most of her resources to get an advantage. Arena unwrapped the package and said that she needed an appraisal on the dagger in question. The man also warned Arena that if after the appraisal she refused to sell it, he would charge her five francs as payment anyway. She agreed with this decision as she would not go bankrupt from it. The man began to examine the dagger closely, and while he was looking at it, Arena looked around and thought that indeed, even their assortment was at the highest level of professionalism. He said that this was a worthwhile item, and it had a high degree of dragon bone content and opened the knife. Arena rejoiced at this, and a sign popped up that the god of art shrugged, and also Arena asked how much he could value it at. It seemed to the man that its lifespan was short. The man, closing the knife, said that dragon bone is a valuable metal, and the value of such a blade is somewhere around 300 francs. Arena's eyes shone at that price. Dan still didn't understand how the saint realized that this dagger was valuable. Arena replied with a smile on her face that she was guided by God. And immediately a plaque appeared saying that the God of Arts was pleased with her honesty. Arena in place with the appraiser, shook hands and made the deal, and then he went to get the money. And that behind her back, a new plaque popped up, and it said that she had accumulated wealth thanks to the gods, and that the store function had been unlocked. The next moment Anna, the maid, came and joyfully informed the saint that she had come to serve her since she had completed her five-day training. And since Anna had completed her training from now on, the saint could rely on her. After these words, the saint asked her to bring her a violet cake and apple tea. Then Anna, happier than ever, ran to get the cake and tea. Arena exhaled, and it seemed to her as if she had a little sister. And at the same minute she sat down at the table, and the sign came up, and she wanted to understand the meaning of the phrase that the store function was unlocked. Arena kept looking at the sign and wondering what it could mean. She also thought it was time to deal with what she knew, since it was the door through which she could communicate with the gods who trusted her. And it seems because her trust level is still low, and the gods private can't join. And because of the gods' help through blessing and inspiration, she can improve her skills. And she could also use the skills of the gods themselves, like she did with Monty at the auction. And now there was something else new for her, some kind of store. The window popped up again indeed. It looked exactly like the game's interface. And if it was, she decided to check and started clicking something on that plate. And it was just as she thought, the currency was francs. And if the current amount was in francs, then it was no different than real money. But she also realized that if she didn't have any money, she wouldn't get any money from the store. And the sign said that she could collect the reward for opening the store. So she decided to collect the reward first, and she wondered how to put money on the balance. And as a reward for opening the store, she got a multifunctional bag. It shone in her hands. She began to squeeze it to understand what it was made of and what was in it. There was no money in it, and Arena wondered how this multifunctional bag was different from a normal bag. It dawned on her that if she put money in the bag, it would be credited to her balance at the store. She was glad that even though she had put 500 francs in it, it added weight. And perhaps someday it would be to her advantage. Since the money problem was solved, but most of the items are blocked and she can't see what's in there. And she assumed it was because of the low trust level. But despite the low trust level, she could buy simple items or small portions of potions. But from the looks of it, they weren't very useful, but they could increase her power. And this was a magic item store. And if her trust level increased, the number of items available would also increase. And it would be nice to have as many buff items as possible. Then there was only one thing left for her to do, which was to put all her savings from today onwards. The gods also offered her a mission to donate all the money from the pouch. She agreed to donate it, and then as a reward the gods gave her pure divine power. And in Arena's hands appeared divine power. And this power was so warm that it was as if she was next to the fireplace, and this warmth seemed to seep into her body. Now Arena didn't understand what to do, why she didn't feel anything and if anything had changed at all. Then again the signs from the gods appeared again. The god of love congratulated her for receiving divine power and blessed her. The god of knowledge blessed her for discovering divine power. The god of arts congratulated her for receiving divine power. It was only when she received the blessing of the gods that she felt a surge of strength and thanks to chest 
that all her thoughts fell into place. Also thanks to Monty's blessing, the formerly luxurious room now seems mediocre. And in a video side effect, every flaw in the chandelier was now an eyesore. Now she thought she would see what Odysseus's blessing would give her, but she realized that she didn't have a lover and didn't know what love was and wondered if Odysseus's blessing was appropriate in this case. But something was still wrong. As saints, because of restrictions, can only use a certain amount of power, but her divine power is another possibility to use. The divine power is limited, and that is the divine power. Because the divine person in the history of unlimited divine power was Venus. And she was wondering why she had been given this power. And at that moment, someone knocked on the door and she let them in. And she thought that Arena was already a saint who had no divine power and would have to give up her seat when the main character appeared. But then she suddenly got this power and she was going crazy not knowing what was going on. Ray walking into her room asked her what if she couldn't deal with something she could tell him since she didn't look good. She leaned back in her chair stretched and said that there was nothing wrong and she was just a little worried. Then she opened her eyes and realized that the high priest was standing in front of her. Arena jumped up from her chair in horror and greeted the high priest. She apologized to him as she thought it was her maid, Anna. Well, Arena, you also didn't understand why he was even so suddenly came to her. Did the man Slavka told about the dagger from the auction? Since selling things and secretly buying money is almost like running off somewhere in the middle of the night. She decided to try to ask why he had come to her, altered her and told her that it was okay and she could chat with him informally. Well, Arena said that she can't afford to talk like that on equal terms with his eminence but he asked him to call him by his first name. She was surprised and didn't understand why he would ask her to do such a thing. He seemed sober, not drunk. Even when he came in, his cheeks were red. She was startled and called him Mr. Ray, but Ray said she should call him without Mr. Ray, but she didn't understand if you could call anyone by their name but your friends, and she said she needed to think about it. Then he realized what he had said and apologized that it just came out of his mouth and he didn't mean to say it. Arena decided to ask him what was bothering him, but he said that everything is fine and he just came to say hello so he feels something strange in his heart. Since today when he sees the one he usually can't stand, he missed her so much. So he approached her and sandwiched her between the table and himself, but then abruptly stepped away from her apologized and said he'd come back later. But the only thing that crossed the arena's mind was that he might be sick. But then a new sign from Odysseus surfaced that he marveled at Ray's fortitude before the blessing. Also a sign from the God of Knowledge surfaced that he thought that Ray's old-fashioned soul did not suit her. And also the God of Arts thought that aesthetically, Ray deserved to be her husband. The God of Knowledge proposed to vote to cancel the blessing of the God of Love and the God of Mercy, rejected the proposal as all gods have the right to bless. Arena did not understand what the gods were arguing about at that moment. There was another knock at her door, and she turned around, not knowing who came this time. But now came Anna who brought tea as she had asked, and a cake. When Arena saw that she had brought her the food she had asked for, she was happy and thanked her for it. She told the saint that it might sound silly, but she looked even more beautiful today than usual. And she would even say that it would be strange for someone who didn't love her, as one could call such a special feeling. But then Arena realized what was going on. After all, it was all because of the blessing of the God of Love. Arena thanked her and told her that she would eat everything later, as she wanted to read alone and asked her to leave her alone. It was now clear to her that it was all because of the blessing. At this time, Ray was walking down the corridors and didn't understand why he was around this girl thinking such things. He was beginning to think that it was a test or a price for atoning for the crimes. And so Ray decided to pray to the God of Arts and he asked God to heal and bless his sinful body, otherwise then he would not be able to bear any more. So Saint was walking in the garden in the afternoon with her maid Anna, and she was telling her that she had become the most popular among the servants. And she said that the other maids asked her a lot of questions because she served the saint, and the maid asked her about her taste preferences, even though she knew the rules of the temple. So Anna didn't tell her anything, and if rumors about the saint spread around the temple, it definitely won't be because of her. Arena turned around and with a smile told Anna that she believed her. She also added that she would never change her mind and not to worry. Anna was touched and then thanked and bowed to the saint. Marina looked at her and thought that it looks like the people in the temple keep spreading rumors, but it's okay because it's normal. 
After all, after receiving divine power, but I only went to the library to find a way to replenish the budget since the saint is the religious leader of the nation, and the palace and temple are the two pillars on which the empire stands, and she is on top of the temple. However, she passed on refusing to participate in almost all official events citing health problems, and she will not have the popularity and influence of previous saints. It was strange that the temple had no reaction to this, but even if there were problems, Ray would solve them. Time wanted to tell Anna that there was no point in proving something to everyone she met, because on the words of others, so she didn't have to worry about it. Arena cried at that and apologized since she said a lot of nonsense. Arena hurried to calm her down and said that everything was fine and she was just worried about her. But then in the bushes next to them, something behind the ball business, Arena moved the bushes with her hand and saw that there lay a wounded bird. It was a blue-winged bird, that the injury was serious and she felt sorry for such a bird. But she saw that the bird was still trying to flap its wings. It was trying to survive. And she remembered that if she made a mistake, she could die too. And the feeling of death before the soul left the body was something she could never forget, the struggle with death. But Arena still decided to take the bird in her arms. And she thought to herself that if this bird could live on. And at that moment, some incredible glow appeared and a sign appeared that the body of the chosen by the gods are covered with divine power. And she was able to heal this bird. The bird was whole and unharmed, all wounds healed, and it was able to fly away. And then, a moment later, a sign appeared that said if she wanted a reward for her first use of divine power. It was only now that she realized that she had just saved a bird. But apparently it wasn't just Arena herself who felt it, but her maid Anna also realized that she had just seen the divine power. Arena said it was just a bird, but Anna said that many priests cure people, but even with prayers with a Bible, it is not easy to cure someone. And the saint didn't even pray, because the bird was almost dead, but then it just took off. Arena put her hand on Anna's arm and asked her not to tell anyone about it and asked her to keep it all a secret. After all, the reason why she could take a little risk before is because she already knew the future, if because of the divine power. Then in this alien world, her fate will only be in her hands, but she just wants a peaceful life. So she asked Anna to promise her that she would keep it all a secret. Anna said that of course she will keep it a secret, and it is her order, and she will not tell anyone about it, and bowed to her. Arena suggested that Anna take a walk in the garden and find a new variety of roses. Well, somewhere in the garden sat Ray and drank tea, and the man asked him a question why it was necessary to do such a thing to a blue fly. After all, it is not a prey. Ray answered that it should have been better trained to stop biting its master. Arthur, the guild heir, was sitting next to Ray and told him that this was what training should be like. Ray replied that it wasn't with dogs, but he had done it many times, and Arthur asked if it had worked, to which Ray replied that he didn't know, but it didn't bite his master anymore. Ray also thanked Arthur for saving his beloved white brass, for he had heard that she was not suited to this climate and he would not forget what he had done for him. To which Arthur replied that it was nothing to his guild, and now the temple festival would be a success. Thanking him again, I told him that he would move them to the greenhouse and have the gardener do it when the festival was over. And at that moment, Ray thought that the high priest who was stale as a dry man suddenly became interested in the flowers. And at that moment, a blue fly flew onto Arthur's shoulder Ray said he thought the dog had mauled it badly, but it looked all right. That this bird had a red spot on its forehead because it was the same bird he picked out. But he didn't understand how it stayed in one piece. And she said that this bird seems to have been cured by a high-ranking priest. Ray said that it seemed to be a help from God's mercy. And at that moment, Arena saw Ray in the garden. And she couldn't understand what Ray was doing in the garden. And she thought it was better to get out of here quickly and said that she didn't know he would have guests and apologized for disturbing them. Just as Arena and Anna were about to leave, Ray decided to ask if she had decided to go out for a walk. But she turned around and replied that may all the gods and all the guests of the temple bless him and bowed to him. And Ray wished her the same and bowed in return. And Ray asked to be allowed to introduce Arthur, the owner of a small trade guild, and said that he could be called Marquis Arthur. But she couldn't believe it was really Arthur and he replied that it was a part for him to meet her as a temple saint. 
And then she realized that it was very strange, since he was not supposed to see Arena, and she said that she was glad to meet him too and greeted him. Ray asked Arena why she came for a walk in the garden accompanied by a maid. Also blushing, he said that she could have asked him to accompany her. Arena could not believe it and said that how could she distract such a busy man? But then someone ran up to the high priest saying that something had happened and she whispered in his ear. Ray told Arthur that there were some problems with the construction site and he needed to go and see for himself. Arena was about to leave, but Arthur said that he was clear and said that they would socialize for now and wished Ray to come back soon. And now they were left alone and looked at each other not knowing where to start the conversation. Arena couldn't understand what was wrong with him because he looked scarier than Ray. But Arena decided to turn to Marquis Arthur and said that she would rather go as she still had some business to attend to. And then a blue-winged bird flew to her shoulder. She recognized the bird she had cured. Arthur asked her if she had seen this bird before. Arena told him while she was stroking the blue fly that she had recently come across it. Arthur said that this bird had been trained to only fly up to its master, but it had become so attached to her that it was some kind of miracle. Arena then realized that it was his bird. Arthur replied that he thought the bird was already dead, and with this he threw Arena into a wild horror and shock. 